This is the story of a remarkable man who was determined to bring light into the world. Avraham ben Avraham was my cousin, but because he was much older and another generation, we called him Uncle Abi. Blind since early childhood, he had to find ways to navigate his world. When we were little, we had to stand in front of Uncle Abi and he always put his hands on our shoulders and he would measure us to see how we'd grown. And he would touch our faces and he would ask us sometimes, what color are you wearing? And I asked him, what does color mean to him? And he knew that red was fiery and hot and blue was soothing. He wanted to, I think, picture us in his mind. Officially, I'm Abraham, but they call me Abi. Abi lost both his parents by the time he was five and was brought up by his step-parents in Zastron, a small town in South Africa's Orange Free State. I don't remember seeing. They told me that I can't see and I had to accept it. Although there was no school for blind children in Zastron, their home was the Cheda, a place of Jewish learning. Without any Hebrew braille to guide him, all Abi could do was to sit quietly and listen to the lessons. He was too young for the classes, so he sat in the corner. But the Hebrew teacher soon picked up on the fact that he was the only one who was really listening and learning everything by rote. When I was about five, an old Reverend Eisman taught me the Shema by heart. He said it to me, and I had to repeat it. From that day on, Abi was determined to learn as much as he could, and by the time he was a young man, he'd memorized the entire Torah off by heart, guided by learned teachers around him. When I started from Genesis, and it said there that the world was in darkness, and the Lord said, Yehi or, let there be light. And I decided as a child, I want to f feel that I am enjoying some light. No matter even if I can't see, I would like to contribute light to humanity. He only went to school when he was 15 years old to Worcester School of the Blind, and that was far away from even where his then family were living. I, I can just imagine uh, what he went through going to the Worcester School for the Blind. I mean, I ended up there when I was five years old. My parents made the call. It must have been so hard, so hard to, to navigate the unknown of a town you don't know, a, a boarding house you don't know, a school you don't know, people you don't know. Abi was the only Jewish pupil at the school, so the local rabbi and his family took him under their wing. He joined them for Sabbaths and high holidays, learning the prayers and services by heart and deepening his commitment to his faith. Then, as he neared the end of high school, Abi made a bold decision that would define the rest of his life. At the Worcester School of the Blind, they offered to teach him basket weaving. And he said, absolutely not. I'm going to earn my living by teaching Torah. And they laughed at him, including the family. They thought he was nuts. And they thought he was too ambitious. They said, you are making the biggest mistake of your life. Who is coming to a blind person to learn for Bar Mitzvah? And which congregation will ever engage a blind person to conduct a service? He just knew that this is what he wanted to do and nothing was going to stop him. Kanto Immenman must have had a tremendous difficult choice to make, to actually have the courage and the conviction to say, I am not going to be just any other blind man, especially when he had no ability to see the words on the text, on the pages. As a blind person, one could easily be suffocated by fear. 
I think he made fear his friend. With a young helper at his side, A.B. travelled to far-reaching communities who slowly came to trust in his remarkable abilities as a canter. He settled in Otsun for 15 years and then headed to Cape Town where his reputation spread and soon he became known as the Blind Canter. It couldn't have been easy for him. He would stand on the beamer and he would lead the services. He didn't hesitate. There was no fear or apprehension. You could see the conviction and the self-security that he had. I conducted the services at Claremont, at Maitland, at Mowbray. There was a Ponneville school. I went to Woodstock, Paro, at Belleville, at the Strand. He used to get around free to hook and town all by himself. It must have been jolly difficult, but he was very, very positive about life and very determined. Cantor Emmerman was one of those sort of people that was instantly recognisable in our community. He must have, to a large degree, have had his own problems. He must have struggled with life, but we never saw that. He never ever reflected that onto anyone. I was always amazed as a young boy as to how this incredible man could walk unaided, immaculately dressed in a suit, hat and his white walking stick. My age was approaching my bar mitzvah day and my father said, we must find you a teacher to do your bar mitzvah. Kanta Imerman had not taught any boys in Cape Town before and he proposed that I be his first pupil. <laughs> We had a little book, so the bar mitzvah portion was inside a book, and he knew the exact page, the exact paragraph. He would say, turn to page 16 and paragraph 2, we're going to do that one now. He knew the whole prayer book, the whole siddur, off by heart, and he knew the whole Torah off by heart. His vision was so accurate that he could see the word on the page better than I could see the word on the page. Every phrase has a musical note. And those musical notes have to be memorized one after the other in incredible level of sequences. For someone to be able to memorize the full five books of Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy would be the most incredible mammoth task, not just the word, not just the grammatical terms, but the most difficult part would be the musical notes. And when I made a mistake, he would say, okay, everybody makes mistakes in life, but you will make it better. In his lifetime, he taught thousands and thousands of boys. Sometimes uh, I had four bar mitzvahs on one Saturday. I had one bar mitzvah at Claremont, and one in Friedhoek, and one in the Garden School, and one in Skundersen, and they all happened to be on the same day. And I couldn't manage to be all over. Kenta Immerman was incredibly tough. And he had to be with someone like me, someone who didn't want to learn, someone who didn't want to be with him, and someone who certainly didn't want to have a bar mitzvah. My mom said to him, you're the only person that can see my kid properly. And he said, no, no, not see him, see right through him. He had an aura about him that was very welcoming, warm, and inspiring. When I stood on the bimmer, it was fantastic to know that Kanta Immerman was there. He was there besides you. It didn't matter if you sang out of tune. He was incredibly encouraging. He was, in fact, the hero of the day at the Bermitzvah. It was him singing, not me. He came to our school, Herzliar, in 1942, when we were situated in Hope Street. He would accompany the school on outings to the countryside and he remained a teacher 
when Herzliya relocated further up the hill. He lived in Friedehoek and he used to walk up Batenkant Street on his own with his stick. He would come into the school knocking on each Hebrew class at the exact right time to teach singing and the Torah. I used to come to a class, they gave me 10 minutes for singing. But that 10 minutes was enough time for him to be able to teach these beautiful melodies and these beautiful words that he had memorized, totally memorized. And some boys used to say that I saved them because the teacher asked them a question and they didn't know the answer and I just walked in in time. So being born blind, you, you soon realize that you have to focus, I guess, much harder than the average person. Your brain is constantly having to evolve um, and expand its own ability and capacity to live an independent life. As more and more people encountered his abilities, they marveled at Abie's extraordinary mind, and still do to this day. I depended on my memory, and, uh, and I tried to develop it. I believe that his mind became his best friend. It became his book of reference. It became the way he, he used it to interact with people. And I think what, what also made people feel so great was the fact that he remembered them. Years later, he would bump into me, tell me my name from the intonation of my voice, exactly what portion it was that I sang and how I behaved. I don't know how he did it. He would say, oh, you so and so. Yes, well, you, you were born and so and so and you remember his place of birth. It, 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 it's unbelievable. If you didn't want to greet him, you didn't have to because he wouldn't know you were there. Yet everybody, everybody streamed towards him when he was at the function because his inner light shone upon everyone else. He attracted love and companionship too, marrying Nora and then Pauline and surviving them both. Abi never had any children of his own, but left a powerful gift for all of us, that despite darkness in our own lives, the light is always there. In our mystical belief, we know that every human being is endowed with an inner light, an inner splendor. And there are very few people in this world who are able to take that inner light and allow others to actually see it. Now, Kanto Immerman had that incredible ability. Vision is not about how well you see, it's about what you see. And Kanto Immerman saw the ability to serve people and help people and dedicated his whole life to that, despite being in what most people would think would be a very dark situation. Not only did he see right through me, he saw what was shining from me. He managed to take that little bit of brightness that I had at that age Despite the fact that everyone thought there was a lot of darkness with me, he saw that and whatever shone from him then reflected onto me and it made me shine. Leonard Cohen said in one of his songs, there's a crack in everything, that's where the light comes in. I cannot imagine my life um, as a blind person um, without light, but I guess light for him was the one thing that kept guiding him through his life. Cantor Emmerman was my friend. And I feel very proud, actually, to be able to say that. He modelled a resilience and a fortitude that I've never seen before. He could see what most of us couldn't. He had a formula. He had a gift. He taught us positivity and he was an absolute mensch. He also said that nothing is impossible if you really want it to happen. And that's how he lived his life. There are people who are sent to this world to light our way, and he was one of them. His legacy and his example really can help us to get past the darknesses that we have in our life and move to the light. He was the most seen blind man that I've ever encountered in my eternal life. I believe that there is no such a thing as darkness in the world. There is light but you've got to look for it, and you've got to search, and you've got to do everything in your power to bring happiness to humanity. That should be your aim in life.
Take your chances, what will be? Use each opportunity. Take your chances, you will see. Use each opportunity. Give it time.